The Old Testament today comes from Proverbs 1, 1 through 7, your pew Bible, page 449. Proverbs 1, 1 through 7. The Proverbs in the Bible were given to help us live godly lives. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for attaining wisdom and discipline, for understanding words of insight, for acquiring and acquiring a disciplined and prudent life, doing what is right, just, and fair, for giving prudence to the simple, knowledge and, and dis discretion to the young, let the wise listen <clears throat> and add to their learning, and let the discernment get guidance, for understanding proverbs and parables, the saying and riddles of, wise, of the wise, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fools despise wisdom and discipline. The New Testament today comes from 1 Corinthians 1, 18-25, Pew Bible, page 807. 1 Corinthians 1, 18-25. Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God personified. God's wisdom was shown in his grace that gave Jesus Christ for our salvation. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. <clears throat> Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs. Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Will you please stand for the gospel if you're able? The gospel comes today from Matthew 7, 24 through 27, Pew Bible 686. Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Jesus instructs his disciples to those who obey his words are wise, while those who do not obey are not wise. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built, who built his house on rock. Then the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house. Yet it did not fall, because it was its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. You may be seated. Proverbs is one book in the Bible that's very clear about its purpose, why it was written and why it's there. And that's what we read in the, our first lesson, the beginning of the book of Proverbs. It says it's for attaining wisdom and discipline and all those good things, all those things we want to have in our life. Doing what is right and just and fair, giving prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion. All those things that we just love to have and we don't know where to get them apart from God's word. Psalms also similarly invites us to enter into God's word if we want to know how to live a good life, how to live a life that's pleasing to God. Psalms 34 is one such example quoted by Peter actually. In verse 11 of Psalm 34, we're invited to come, my children. Listen to me, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your spit lips from speaking lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. And so we have Proverbs-type wisdom throughout the scriptures. Proverbs, in fact, 
is roughly a, a, an Old Testament word that the definition is very much like that of the New Testament word parables. It's a word that's put in front of us for wisdom, a word that's put in front of us for instruction. Sometimes it's a picture uh, uh, that shows us the way to live. Proverbs, a word for instruction. This morning I'd like to just simply share a few of the Proverbs that have meant a lot to me over the years and some that I've tried to uh, incorporate into my life, things, Proverbs I've tried to live by. I'd like to just share a few of those. And of course there are many, many Proverbs that uh, we can live by. Uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, if you'd like to follow along. Proverbs 2, verses 1 through 5. My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. And I love that picture. I've been to some of the gold and silver mines in Cripple Creek and other places in Colorado. And if you've been there, you know that it's just kind of like a honeycomb down under the mountains. You know, all you see is this big, huge rock that you can drive on. But underneath, there are tunnels and caverns and even railways for cars to take rock out of the inside of that mountain so that gold and silver can be extracted from it. And it's hard work. It's dangerous work. They have to take their own light in there even and make sure that the airways stay clear so that the, the workers can breathe. But it's difficult. In the caverns, in the depths of the earth, mankind goes to find precious metals. And not just gold or silver, but almost anything useful that's of metal was, is found underground like that. The Bible says that's how we're to seek for wisdom. It doesn't generally just drop down out of the sky to us. And I'm not suggesting for a moment that God doesn't sometimes give us revelations, because he does. God will sometimes put an idea in your head. He'll reveal to you the right way to go or the right thing to do. But most generally, even then, it's a result of us spending time abiding with the Lord, abiding in his word. And not only abiding, but you know, we, with abiding, that's kind of a, it sounds like it's a passive activity. We just wait on the Lord. We rest in the Lord. And all those synonyms, we live in God's house. You know, it's something we uh, tend to quietly think about and do. But that's not the picture we have here in Proverbs 2. Look for it as for silver. Search for it as for hidden treasure. It's an active thing. We work hard at it. I determined many years ago that if you want to get wise, you need to read a lot and think a little bit, and that's true. And I've tested it. We can't just do nothing. We can't just expect wisdom to come to us if we don't expend some effort to find it. Job talks about where can wisdom be found, and he too gives that same picture of uh, mines under the ground and people sailing the seas. You know, Ponce de Leon is famous for sailing the oceans and traveling all over Florida, just exploring all sorts of places, looking for the fountain of youth. And we'd know that it's no such place, at least not just some kind of magic water that you can drink that makes you live forever. But the fountain of youth, in fact, Holy Communion was called the medicine of immortality. We have a fountain of youth in Christ. Come to him for the living water, he invited us. I have, in fact, Jesus said, not only I have, I am the life. I am the living water. And so it's something we want to expend some effort to find. Seek diligently for wisdom, Proverbs 2, 1 through 5. Another couple of verses, passage in Proverbs. Proverbs 3 9 through 10. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. And quite simply, this biblical teaching is tithing. 
The Old Testament is more clear on the actual 10%. The New Testament is a little less clear, but Jesus even there says, you should practice the things like love and mercy without neglecting tithing. That's a simple yardstick by which we can measure if our hearts are the least bit generous. And of course, that's the New Testament teaching. If we go to 2 Corinthians 2, 8 and 9, we see, you know, we can sum up uh, the, our Christian attitude for, toward tithing, I mean, toward giving, should be to give from what you have. Don't be uh, feeling guilty because you can't give more, but give from what God has given you. That's what God expects. He doesn't get, expect you to give a million dollars if you don't have a million dollars. He expects you to give from what God has given you, and it doesn't have to just be money either. To give cheerfully and to give generously. And the, the reward that uh, we're promised in 2 Corinthians 9 also is that God will keep giving to us as long as we give cheerfully and generously. That we'll be able to keep on giving. God supplies his givers with what they need so that they may have enough to keep on giving. My mom taught me, mom and dad taught me at a very young age to tithe at least tithe, so much so early that I don't even remember when I never tithed. Of course, I didn't get just a huge allowance. Farm kids back in my, when I was growing up didn't get a whole lot of money. We thought it was a big deal when Grandma gave us a quarter or something like that. I remember one lady gave me a 50-cent piece, and I thought I was rich. But yet, they taught me to tithe it. And even when, we were, when I was in the Bible college, we had two little kids and another one on the way, and there was not a lot of money going around. You know, what little we had was trying to keep us afloat. We didn't have good jobs since I was also a student. And uh, honestly, I was tempted to not tithe. And every once in a while, when I thought I was really in need, we were needy as a family, every once in a while I wouldn't tithe one week, but I'd feel so guilty the next week I'd make it up. Now that's hard. <laughs> have you ever skipped a tithe and then made it back up again? It's not so easy to do, but I can testify that God is true to his word. He pays you back. He keeps on giving so that you have enough. He doesn't always make you wealthy. There are some people that have a gift of making money, and the purpose, of course, is not for self-pleasure, but so that they, too, can enrich others. But God does promise to take care of those who are wholeheartedly taking care of him and his desires. Malachi chapter 3, in fact, says that when we refuse to pay the tithe, we're robbing God. And even though that's Old Testament, you know, the whole teaching of giving fits so well. 10% is not a lot. I mean, if we look at it honestly, we get to keep 90%. And all of it's a gift from God in the first place. So you know, if you think about it that way, it's still a good deal. Start at 10%. Don't work our way up to 10%. Work our way up from 10 to more as God prospers you. But giving to God, honor the Lord with your wealth, and God will take care of you. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Another passage, chapter 5. Proverbs 5, 15 through 21. Drink water from your own cistern, running water from your own well. Should your springs overflow in the streets, your streams of water in the public squares, let them be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers. May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth, a loving doe, a graceful deer. May her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be captivated by her love. Why be captivated, my son, by an adulteress? Why embrace the bosom of another man's wife? For a man's ways are in full view of the Lord, and he examines all his paths. Now, the Bible's pretty good. You know, I think we all know that at telling us what not to do, and that's what the Ten Commandments are, thou shalt not, for the most part. But the Bible's also very good at telling us what to do. And in this case, for instance, also, not only to not commit adultery, but to love, to cherish, to give your attention to the one to whom you are married. Your 
romantic affection should go to one person alone. But do it faithfully. And just like giving, we give our love to that person unreservedly, without limit. And that too is a source of great blessing. And Proverbs is just stocked full of warning of what happens when we fall short in that area and how our finances and our uh, peace of mind and other things are compromised when we don't stay faithful. But the rewards of being faithful are so great as to be almost beyond number. That's why Paul in Ephesians compares the husband-wife relationship to that of Christ in the church. It's that loving, faithful relationship that is the, the closest thing to heaven that we can get on earth. And so our affections, when we are wholehearted in the ways to find love with the person to whom we're married, are well rewarded. We don't have to worry so much about straying if we're worrying about how to please one another in our marriage relationship. In Galatians chapter 5, the passage is not specifically speaking about marriage, but it, it applies. Galatians 5 verse 16 says, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. You might put it the way I heard one preacher say it. I'm so busy with the do's, I don't have time for the don'ts. And that's good. That's true. If we just pay attention to what Jesus wants us to do, what is good for us, we don't have time to worry about all the things the Bible says don't do. And so when we make love and faithfulness and trust the hallmark of our marriage relationship, we'll be fortunate and blessed indeed. Proverbs 10, 19. Proverbs 10, 19. This is one of my favorite ones because it's just kind of amusing to listen to even though it's a good lesson. And it's one that's very easy for us to disregard as well. Proverbs 10, 19. When words are many, sin is not absent, but he who holds his tongue is wise. There's a couple of companion verses in seven, chapter 17, verse 27 and 28. A man of knowledge uses words with restraint, and a man of understanding is even-tempered. Even a fool is thought wise if he keeps silent and discerning if he holds his tongue. Words are kind of like gold. If they're more rare, they're more precious. The more people want them. And if we don't overspeak, if we don't overtalk, we find that we're more listened to. That works when you're raising your kids. It works in council meetings. It works all over. Too many words, just like too much plastic, becomes cheap. The more rare they are, the more they're valued. Some of you, I think, knew uh, Charlie Englehart over at Pocahontas, but he, he had some good sayings every once in a while. The one thing I heard him say was, you can't learn anything if you're doing all the, all the talking. Now we have two ears to listen and one mouth to speak with, and sometimes we need to remember that's a pretty good ratio to begin with. If we do at least twice as much listening as speaking, we're in good shape. And this is one that I especially have to pay attention to because I'm making my living by talking, you know, so <laughs> it's one that it's, uh, it's good for us all to remember, of course. James said, be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to become angry. And Jesus himself uh, advocated simple speech in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, let your yes be yes and let your no be no. Anything else comes from where? You gotta remember? From the evil one. Simple speech and not too much of it. Proverbs 22 verse 1 is another proverb that has meant a lot to me over the years. And this is another one that uh, mom and dad impressed upon my memory. In fact, I think the only reason <laughs> this, this particular problem is so memorable is that mom repeated it so often. It was almost like, you know, eggs for breakfast. This is just what you got every day. 
A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver and gold. And so we need, you know, we need really a good reputation, but more than just reputation, because we can fake a reputation, sort of. You can have a good reputation, and when somebody gets to know who you really are, they're not so impressed anymore. But a reputation backed up by character, that's what we're looking for. And that's what Proverbs is teaching. There's the saying, it takes years to build a good reputation. It takes years to build character, but only a moment to destroy it. And I think we can all see how in a moment of weakness, the good name that we might have built up over the years can be destroyed by one foolish act, one foolish word, and we have to rebuild all over again. But by careful living, according to the words of Scripture, you gain honor and respect from others. You gain the benefit of the doubt. You gain trust. People look up to you. Just don't do what you know to be wrong. Try to be honest and fair and, and seek to make it right again, all according to the words of Scripture. A good reputation, a good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. And then another one, Proverbs 30, 7 through 9. This is actually a prayer, which I find to be one, of the, one prayer that I pray quite often. Proverbs 30, 7 through 9. Two things I ask of you, O Lord, do not refuse me before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, Who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. He had two requests. One was to be truthful, keep falsehood and lies far from me. And the other was to have a moderate income, to have enough. And he gave the reason why. He gave a lot of commentary on why that second request, to have enough, not too much, that he would become complacent or prideful. This is one of the oldest temptations in the book. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, I think it was, Moses warned the Israelites, when you prosper in the good land the Lord your God is giving you, don't become prideful of heart and say, my hands have gotten me all this. My labor has produced all this wealth for me. For it's the Lord God who gives you wealth and the power to produce wealth. And yet the Israelites failed to take heed. And they did fall, partly because of their great um, prosperity. But you know what? Every society since then, and most individuals don't learn from that example. Great wealth does make us complacent. It does make us self-sufficient. And by self-sufficient, that's in a bad way, apart from God. We tend to think that we're the great ones that made all that money. There's a companion proverb to that one, which is also one of the more amusing ones. Proverbs 23, 4 through 5. Don't wear yourself out to get rich. Have the wisdom to show restraint. Cast but a glance at riches, and they are gone, for they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. I think I've, you probably heard me say this before, but I remember Red Skelton say, money does talk. Mostly to me, it says goodbye. <laughs> Rockefeller was asked one time, the one who founded Standard Oil, of course he had plenty, he was asked how much money is enough and he said a little bit more. He didn't know this prayer in Proverbs chapter 30. Give me only by daily bread, neither poverty nor riches. And the other temptation, becoming poor and stealing, that brings dishonor to God's name. Because we pray in the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Or may, may your name, hallowed be your name. That's what we want is God's name to be honored. And we do that when we live a God-honoring life. So the prayer for moderation in Proverbs 30, 7 through 9. And then one more proverb that has meant a lot over the years. 
And actually, there's, it's kind of it has a companion. But back in Proverbs 1 again, verse 7, part of our Old Testament reading. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. And the companion to 1-7 is Proverbs 9-10, which says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And these are meaningful to me because this leads us out of Proverbs and into the New Testament. Because all wisdom, human wisdom, divine wisdom, must lead to Christ or it is useless to us. We can live the smartest, most intelligent life. We can do all the things that Proverbs says. We can avoid adultery and, and work on our own marriage. We can uh, have the right attitude about money. We can do all these things, even give 10%. But if we don't know God, it's all useless. It's all worth nothing. Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, the beginning of wisdom. And the New Testament pointed out to us in, in Corinthians that Christ is the wisdom of God. Because no matter how well we keep these Proverbs or any other good thing, the Ten Commandments, we can't keep them all. It only takes one slip up to keep us out of heaven. Just one, because heaven is perfect. No imperfections allowed. And so the best wisdom of all is to follow Jesus, knowledge of the Holy One, to follow Jesus. He is the source that of, that is, of all that is good in this life and in the life to come. And he is the way, the truth, and the life, the way to get eternal life through the cross which he died upon in order to forgive us of our sins, that we might have, that we might be regarded as the righteousness of Christ. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. My sheep know me and they follow me. Jesus said, whoever hears my words and obeys them is wise. Therefore, let us, after study of Proverbs, after putting them to practice, let us make sure we also are diligent about seeking after the Lord Jesus. It's his death on the cross. It's his life. It's his forgiveness that gives us eternal life. This I pray for all of us in Jesus' name. Amen.